Hey guys, Bree here, Fanatic Perspective, with my special guest, Steve. Hey guys. <laughs> so I'm excited to have my wife on here. She's going to make her debut, my lovely wife, Bree, here. And welcome to Fanatic Thanks. Perspective officially, in terms of all of our lovely viewers out there. Please make sure you like, share, and subscribe. We have a very special video today because one of the things we like to do, we love watching documentaries, docu-series, crime related. That's like, that's your, that's right up your alley, mm -hmm. right? It is. So one of the, the, the recent ones we watched this weekend, and I, and I kind of hinted at this on a previous video, was the Greg Kelly uh, documentary called Outcry, which debuted July 5th on Showtime. It was actually originally supposed to debut at South by Southwest. Aww, that's but sad. That sucks, right? And, and hopefully everybody stands safe with COVID. Watch the table so we don't kick the camera too much. Uh, she's learning as we go along. Uh, but Greg Kelly, young man from Leander, right down the street from us, neighbors in Williamson County. We live here in Austin proper in Travis County. Uh, so our folks over in Williamson County, Leander, Texas, high school football star, and gets caught up in a situation where he is accused and eventually convicted of super aggravated sexual assault. Spoiler alert, by the way. Oh, yes. This is, this is going to be – we're going to talk about what's going on. So if you want to – I'm just painting the picture here because it's been all over the news for the last mm -hmm. six, seven years now. Many of you who are here in Central Texas do know about it. Nationally, this is brand new in terms of probably the coverage and whatnot. I don't know if the story ever went nationally originally. I had probably, I think we had just started dating. I probably just started moved here when it happened. So I didn't, I wasn't too in the loop on it as, as the situation. No, it occurred. happened in 2013 and he was arrested in 2014. So we were definitely already living together. No, I moved right? here in 2012. Yeah, but it happened in. I hadn't even been here a year when it happened. Well, I don't know. Okay. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> Sam, trust me okay, with the timelines. Okay, okay. All right, let's look at that's my, that's my, time. trust me with the timelines, all right, so anyway, being here in Central Texas, Greg Kelly goes down for super baited, super aggravated sexual assault against a four-year-old child, very, very sad situation, um, and, and I'm not going to go into recapping the whole series, it's a five-part series, it's very well done, Pat Condales, who was the one that directed it, very well done on his behalf, so I actually just want to start talking with you. What we'll do is just kind of takeaways because this resonated with me as a University of Texas fan, starting to hear a lot of the hype around Greg Kelly possibly looking to walk on to the University of Texas football program at 25 years old, getting back, trying to regain a sense of his life. And I mm -hmm. feel like with Greg Kelly, I'm going to share something and then, I, and then I want you to chime in. I feel like football is like that last piece that he's missing. For, for completion since when he went away, served three years in prison, right, before he ended up getting the, the bail and all that type of stuff. So that was something that really resonated with me, and I'm going to touch on more of the UT stuff, football-related later. When we finish this program, because one of the rules we have is we don't like to do too much Googling while we're watching. We like to be present while we're watching these things. When it concluded, episode five, mm -hmm. What character or what person was the one who you just had to go and look up right away? Mm. Jake Bryden. Easily Jake Bryden because they never said why he was involved. They just, he, he, he was just thrown in like randomly and was like, I, you know, I saw it on the news and then my buddy called me and then I just got involved and he became this like number one advocate and it didn't make any sense why he like it seemed like he stopped his whole life to fight for Greg Kelly which was great and obviously super needed but they gave no backstory to who he Very was little backstory. what obviously he was rich he had a plane in one of the scenes like he was like they were man's, waiting for the news never saw man's at work <laughs> it was insane never worked he was waiting for the the news um to like release on like what was happening with greg and like he was literally sitting in his private jet like if things go good i'm gonna fly if things go bad i'm gonna fly like i don't know he was like super rich so i googled him um did not find a single thing immediately right like we googled and then we searched 
like YouTube because that's what we do from the television and there was nothing. So finally, after joining like all of the Facebook groups about Greg Kelly that there are to join, I found there was an article published, I don't remember when, but a while back about how Jake was on a team that was coached by Gabriel's dad. Jake was. Jake, yes. So I didn't okay. see what kind of team or sports or whatever, but mm-hmm. he was on a team coached by Gabriel's dad. And hold on, let's and for those obviously if, if you've watched this or know about that, Gabriel is was Greg Kelly's girlfriend, now fiance or now wife. Met wife. Yeah. Ended up being fiance, now wife. Yeah. So he was the he was a coach. And so I guess Jake, um, well, not I guess I know Jake thought that the dad, um, which he called Coach P, which was his last name was Anderson. So and that's probably a whole other thing. But co- the coach um, was is a like just really nice guy, and so it really threw Jake off whenever he saw the coach on the news like advocating for a sex offender um, or alleged sex offender, alleged. and so that's what made him want to like really dig in and find out more. So that was the first person I googled and ended up finding more info on. So super interesting. One of the things, and the, the and that's a, that's it's it's been interesting because he's still very very involved with. Greg Kelly with protesting the police chief, which is what we want to move into next. Sean Mannix, uh, Chris Daly, who was the lead detective in a mm. case, and they got a they got a horrible edit in this documentary. And and it's whether you guys want to blame editing or if you want to blame the situation, whatever. They don't look good no. on, on, on tape. They look terrible. Um, they they seem to have gotten behind because it was an open shut thing and they want to, you know, we've been watching the wire lately. So it's like, you hear the term clearance rate or just, you know, getting up, getting cases closed and off the table. And it seemed like the easy play to go after Greg Kelly. And then there's somebody else. It's all going to lead me around to this. Jonathan McCarty, who looked at the time, had a very strong, almost twin like resemblance to Mr. Greg Kelly and was more, more, most likely the one that committed those horrible acts yeah. against the young four-year-old child. So when you look at what the transgressions were with Jonathan McCarty immediately following these mm-hmm. situations, and the fact that the police chief, the detectives, none of them, they heard the name Jonathan thrown around, but they never did their due diligence, even working within uh Jonathan's mother her name was Shama the daycare that they were running at the house which is how this whole situation came about that lack of wanting to just say you know what maybe we might be off on this you know maybe just humbling yourself they never wanted to go there I truly believe either Mannix still thinks that Greg Kelly did it or he will he doesn't want to admit that he's wrong yeah. And he'd rather die with the ship because we're going to get into the aftermath of this whole, since this documentary came, I mentioned the documentary came out July 5th. There's been a lot of, not, a lot that's gone down since then. People losing jobs, all sorts of crazy situations going on and a lot of protesting that is still going on on behalf of Greg Kelly, even um, in regards to restitution. Yeah. Well, so one thing that I really want to get into in, in terms of, Mannix and Daily. So during when we were watching it, we pushed pause. I feel like so many times to say like, okay, we we break down. We why it. like like what is going on? And let's play the benefit of the doubt and just try to think about this from their perspective for a minute. And so one thought that I kind of have is that maybe they like expedited Greg Kelly's case to get I forget her name, but who is the DA? Jana Duty. Um, wait, I thought she was the judge. No, no, no. She was the okay. DA. Okay, so she was the DA. Okay. Yeah, that so was to elected. get Jana Duty elected, because so maybe they expedited Greg's case to get Jana Duty elected so that because her like whole ammo was like, I'm the hammer. Like I like I, like one of the videos mm-hmm. was like, let's we need balls or like something bit. like that. So um <laughs> it was it was like literally balls. and it was like we slip art or like balls like bouncing and it like it Anyways, so they had a hype video. Yeah, it was strange, but th- that's the only thing I can think of that 
is a reason why they would have expedited her his case right and like convicted him so quickly without even like looking at anything else because there are literally so many things that point to the fact that it was not greg kelly every single step of the way there was a sign that it's not Greg Kelly, and they didn't even. It was incredible to see how poorly handled the entire situation was, even the botching of the interviews with the kids. Because at one point, there were two kids that came that w- carried yeah. allegations against Greg Kelly. One of the kids came, you know, refuted their statements because they never really came out and said anything. They were kind of coerced into saying so yes and this led to another discussion that Stephen and i had because the only reason the second child came in for the interview or um cac i think is what they called it um character uh, uh, he's, uh, he's, so, anyway, the, the, second, the only reason the second child was even brought in for questioning was because chris daly called their parent to say hey there's Someone at your same daycare mm-hmm. has a, there was a charge against yeah. the person or whatever. So Stephen and I talked about, well, like, was that the right thing to do or not? And so Stephen stands on the side of, yes, like, if I had a child in a daycare, I would want the police to call me and say, yes, this has happened to a child. In the Whereas, same daycare that's in a house. Well, okay, yes, but... Context matters here. Also, I feel like the parent is automatically going to be so enraged and be like, did someone touch you? And they're going to, like, put these thoughts in the kid's head of, like, maybe this happened to me. I don't know. It's such a sensitive subject, so I'm interested to hear, like, what everyone else thinks about that. So how, how upset would you be if you found out about that just in the news and your child was going there every day and no one told you? Maybe, maybe, and maybe Shama sent a note or sent something out to the family saying oh well i think people need to be notified but to i guess it depends on how many kids are at that daycare but it was it was it was a sexual allegation a sexual assault allegation yes but the question the point is that the questioning or like the way that you I interview agree. a child right. is so specific well, and it's difficult he shouldn't have been in the room in my opinion he came into the room with his firearm yeah and was in oh, oh you're talking about Chris in the room yes yes see I, I don't think the kids should have been in a bedroom like there's no reason for a child to have ever no, been no, no, in no, a bedroom. no 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 i'm talking about when they conducted the interview right no yeah chris shouldn't have been in the room he shouldn't have been in the room it should have been the professional interviewer yes it, Anyways, it, it challenged the whole situation, and all it does is, because this whole situation ruined, potentially almost ruined all of Greg Kelly's life because he ended up getting sentenced to twenty five years in prison and agreed no to some, parole, no parole, special deal. But yeah. they did explain a lot of the legalities that they were able to work, uh, work in between with his with the new lawyer. I can't remember the gentleman's name, but. You know, because we're going to get into Patricia Cummings, Keith, who was the Keith. who was the defense, yeah. the defense attorney. But I, I was just really, really blown away with that aspect. Greg Kelly's life gets ruined. Then you have the parents and the family of and the child, the victim, who's who has to deal with it now. How you process that at four years old and how you move forward, I have no, I I couldn't imagine. And that's something we deal with in our in this country, right? Mm. Um, from from how children. Are sexually abused so you know the lack of concern and the lack of tact with the cedar park police department um was it was 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 on display for the world to see and um i'm sure there's a level of embarrassment for their community over this situation because is there though because why did it take them so long to make change are they embarrassed I'm talking about now. I don't think they were. Now, yeah. Now that it's been broadcasted all over a documentary, I think, yeah, they're super embarrassed. And that's why action's happening now. But at the time, I think, well, okay. To be fair, I think that anytime someone accuses anyone of doing anything wrong with a child, you automatically believe that it's true. You automatically believe that that person is bad, no matter what, the kid is right. Like, that's automatic but when you really look in further and figure out like this is not 
what they're this saying. This is not, is. maybe what this kid said is true, but we've got the wrong person and that's what's important. But I think that at the time, for whatever reason, like Cedar Park was not embarrassed. But let's go back to the Jonathan McCarty thing because I also, conspiracy Steve here, Shams had a lot to do with this because, uh, or Shama, I'm sorry, the, the, because she, the, they said when she was, in terms of the football ties, A, she was a booster. So let's also give the backstory of why Greg Kelly was even near yeah, the situation, right? So he has parents that are, are struggling. He has, you know, obviously he was, a, uh, for those who saw the other brothers and sisters that he had, he was had later in life as a child and his parents were struggling, had a lot of health issues. He is blowing up at Leander as a okay, football player. Okay, but to player. clarify, not struggling financially. They didn't really go into some of the. They said, I mean, maybe they were, but it was more so health related because of the, the dad had the stroke. And dad everything. had a stroke, and mom had like a an health issue too. Yeah, but I mean, that this is some, anyway. He ends up getting taken in by Shama McCarty. And Jonathan McCarty is, is you know, kind of his one of his best friends best at friend. the time. And, you know, he's also dating Gabri. And and so Jonathan has this crush on Gabri, and it's like this whole, and he kind of looks like Greg. And then okay, on top that, of that. I don't know if he, like, had a crush on Gabri. I mean, Gabri's, like, the star dancer. That's what Gabri insinuated. Well, and I all, think that uh, everyone. More than, more than her insinuated no. it. Right? Uh, Greg Kelly did. Okay, but, like, that's, like, saying, like, oh, he likes me, and then the boyfriend, like, yeah, he likes her. Like, I don't know. Like, we don't know. I think that he's a very, like, sexually charged person, obviously, knowing everything that we know now. Well, But yeah. was he, like, madly in love with Gabri? Well, I, that I don't know. There's there's no way we can defend it. Yeah. I'm just going off of their word yeah. of what they said about the young man. Yeah. But where I was getting at is that I do think there was a bit of jealousy there because Shama is openly broadcasting that Greg Kelly is going to be her football, her football star. She's really tied in as a booster. And this is a guy that's going to go places because they knew pretty early on that Jonathan wasn't that guy. So yeah. the, the dark places that people get led to uh, with these type of things. And then obviously – Jonathan gets convicted of, or, or get, you know, did he, did he, did he uh, say he was guilty to rape of the young lady who actually conducted her interview at Mercury Hall, which is where we got married, and you, aha, right away. But it was, it's just sad uh, how they botched this. I don't feel sad at. I mean, okay, sure, I feel sad. I feel but sad for the victims. I feel yes. I, they have no like. I don't know. I think I feel Jonathan, more angry. Jonathan McCarty served what four years and he's out. I, yeah. So I don't understand why if Greg is if Greg was released, then why are we not investigating somebody else? Because even the Ranger was like, we're there are three suspects: Greg, Jonathan, and one more, which is going to be left unnamed. And so when Greg was let free, literally a year and a half after the Ranger said that. Why have they not started investigating Jonathan or that other suspect? Why don't you ask the ranger? Because he was trying to manipulate this. The ranger has so many questions for him. Yeah. At first, it seemed like he was an advocate and trying to get to the to truth and, and was kind of on Greg's side of trying to get behind this. And then, not, then he started leaking all these character assassinations against him. And it's like, what the hell are you doing, man? Like... Right. Like in court, he testified and was very, like, adamantly pro Greg Kelly. Yes. But then in, in the statement that he wrote, but I do think it's important. So in the statement that he wrote, he wrote that, like, when Greg, um, like, at the time of when Greg moved into the, to Shama's house, then he became, like, um addicted to porn and like visited a porn site 13,000 times a day and like all these like crazy things but his report didn't note that he only had a phone because he lived in Shama's house and I feel like that's so important to know because going from no phone to phone I'm sure that his porn intake is gonna skyrocket <laughs> like especially it's a 
as a 16, 17 year old boy who was claiming to have all these workouts, like a million hours a day of just lifting weights and like, mm, like doing stuff. Like, I don't know. I just, I think that that was an important thing to note and it got left out and he got accused of things. That well, it made us ask the question, how much porn makes you a porn addict? <laughs> yeah. Or, you know, like, is there a threshold? Is it a certain type of porn? You know, you well, guys oh, that in the yeah. comments. That's the other thing. It was interesting that Jonathan had pictures of children on his phone, on his phone, like naked photos naked. of children. You know, all signs point to Jonathan. No, no, but the due diligence wasn't done here, and, and it wasn't done by the the biggest person that should have been the advocate was Patricia Cummings, and she was. There's no way around it. How how inept she was as a defense attorney. She was some sort of family friend of Shama. Again, when you're 18 years old and, and, and these people have done so much for you and your future is ahead of you, because I'm going to get to the football stuff here in a second. It's just unfortunate that people can just squander something and take advantage. And what, I, what I can't figure out is why Patricia Cummings didn't do more. Why she was oh, so- Oh, I can figure that out easy. That's the easiest one in the room. Enlighten me. Because she's been a long-term family lawyer for Shama's family. And all of Jonathan's siblings, well, not all, I don't know how many he has, but they mentioned like three or four. And all of them had like sexual allegations and like mm. all of these things that they had to go to court for. And Patricia Cummings has advocated for them and got them out of so many times. And she immediately knew. when this happened to Greg, Greg's mom was like, what do we do? Obviously, because he's never been in a situation before. It's her daycare. And Shama was like, I've got a person. And then conveniently hires this woman who has stood up for them time and time again. I think Patricia's biggest thing that so, she so, failed so, to do was the date. Well, no. Well, also highlighting the fact that the real suspect was in the home. She didn't, she wasn't ever going to go there, to your point. What do you mean? And Jonathan McCarty. That was their out. Because that's what they ended up, that's how the path they kind of went down the second time. Also, the manipulation of right. the dates. To your point, the manip right. manipulation of the dates is important too. But um, that makes her a horrible person. If you're willing yeah. to, to sacrifice somebody's whole life that's innocent, to go to prison and Lord knows what they do to you in prison. If you, if when they find out about what your charge is right. of, you know, so, you know, I'm sure Mr. Kelly had to do what he had to do in there. And he kind of alluded to that. Um, but thankful for him being out and, and, and it's, and, and I, I, I left that documentary very, very solid, hundred percent believe in he did, he did not do this and he is, yeah. you know, what he's saying. And, and I also want to give credit to, his wife, Gabriel, for being a ride or die. She was there throughout the entire uh, situation. A lot of, I feel like a lot of partners would have left in that situation under those circumstances. Yes. So question. So right when he got out of prison, their whole thing was like, we've been together for four years. Like we're so in love. But they, so if they were together for four years, that means three of those years he was in prison and they've only dated her one year prior to that, which was like high school dating. So like how much do they really know each other? And then like immediately when they got out, like they lived life for like six ish months and it was like this big party celebration. Mm -hmm. And then they just like up and moved to New York. And like, I feel like they're just living so fast. Like how much do they know, truly know each other? You're judging that out of the lens of the documentary though. Like you saw, well, yeah. you're seeing, you're seeing, well, what I mean by that is in the, in the, in the terms of the relationship, they've now, it's now seven, eight years. You're t at that time, yeah, they said at the time they were interviewed because they were, they have different timestamps than when they were talking. So you're saying that since they survived their first three or four years. They're stronger now. Of marriage. Now. Yeah. I mean, well, not, not of marriage. They got married this year. They got married in January. But in terms of in terms of them yeah. being together, yeah, you see what I'm saying. I just like, like it so much. Even even so, I do want to transition before we end the video to the football side of things. 
he is now currently enrolled at the University of Texas. It sounds to me, him growing up here in the Central Texas area, a dream of his was to play and be a Longhorn. So uh, to my knowledge, he had a tryout, I believe a few days ago, if, late last week. I don't know what the specifics on it were, but obviously he was still, I don't know why I keep saying obviously. Obviously, I'm saying obviously a lot. He's in tremendous physical shape. He was working with former, knock it off, former Longhorn Jeremy, Jeremy Hills, Saw the Bacaro brothers in there. Uh, Earl Saw Thomas. a lot of brothers in there. Knock it off. <laughs> so you know, the, it was it was phenomenal to to see him in his element and 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 working on things. And I am optimistic with the story and everything. This is these are again these are the type of things that get turned into movies too. I know it's this was a five-part docuseries, but at some point I could see somebody playing him down the road and going through that whole thing of what mm -hmm. happened. Any, well, any, there's so much more to tell. Like, there's so much of, like, what happens next? Because even the restitution part of the case is not even settled yet. And so the state's been published an article that said that they were estimating he would get $80,000 for each year he was in prison, so three, three years, which is astronomically low, in my opinion. So I, anyway, I would just be fascinated to see what happens next. Like, does he get on the team at UT? What happens with the like restitution amount? I'm sure Jake's going to go in and fight that because that's insane. Um, and then Swoop Hair, Swoop Hair Keith, Swoop Hair, Swoop Hair Keith, like – was great and he should find that restitution too but there's just so much story left to tell i would like to see it like play out for like another five-ish years and then make a movie about like the whole thing sure. so it's i'm fascinated by it so well thank you for joining me on this thanks uh, for joining me <laughs> on this episode of fanatic perspective everybody be safe out there and horns always up Horns always out. Peace.